Jeez. That I've got to say, one. I would not have the plans to nick my coach's room key and go and flip him over whilst he's asleep, bollock naked in bed. Jesus. Well, hello and welcome back to another episode of Rugby Pass Offload with me, Christina Mahan. And today I'm joined by Jamie Roberts and today's special guest, England international Mike Brown. Welcome, guys, and Happy New Year to you both. Happy New Year, Christina. How are you? Good. Good. And yourselves? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Happy New Year. Um, thanks for having me. Nice to see you, Jamie. <laughs> good to see you, mate. Good to see you. Been a, been a <laughs> while since we played at Quinn's together, mate. I know, it has been a while. Um, it feels like a lifetime ago. Yeah. How long ago special, was it, guys? Special memories. Yeah, uh, two, three years ago? Three years ago? 2018. Summer 2018 was when I left Quinn's. So, yeah, yeah two and a half years now. Special memories, on it, Jamie? Good times, mate. Good times, good times. How many appearances are you on now for Quinn's? Like 580 or something? Um, no, I think 330 something or 40 something, I think. So. Jesus. Are you the, are you the, you're the highest by appearances, time. yeah? Yeah, highest, yeah. Yeah, so. And how, many, how, many seasons, how many seasons pro have you been there then? 17, I think. Well, you, you that's must impressive. Have similar. That's Thanks, impressive. Man. You must have done similar now. Mm, I was I was 20. I, I got my freshers here in uni out the way with before I went pro. So um, I, was, I started a bit later. But um, yeah, man, 17, 17 seasons, mate, at one club is mightily impressive. Thanks for coming on the pod, mate. Thanks, mate. Absolutely. So the countdown to the Guinness Six Nations is on. However, England have decided to limit their squad to 28 players in an effort to enhance coronavirus safety measures. Um, but Mike, what impact will that have on the output, especially under Eddie's tra- training regime? Like I know, you know, he's been very fond of having at least 30 players there for 15 aside training, doesn't he? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, usually they, they do. And we have done that a lot in the past 15 or 15. I think that's very um, important usually for, for the preparation. You want to be able to test everything that you want to put on the pitch against, you know, decent opposition. So, you know, that is, that is not going to be able to happen now, but I think that allows him to really focus on on um, you know the 23 that, that he's going to choose. So he obviously has that in mind already, and he can really dial down and focus on those guys instead of you know having uh, other guys that he needs, needs to manage. So there there is um, two sides of it, two two uh, pros of it. So um, and he does like everything streamlined, so he he won't be worried about that. Mike, speaking of Eddie, what's it like working under him? I know, I think, is it George Cruz came out recently to say that it was beyond brutal physically. So what was your experience of training and working with the main man? Yeah, it's, it's bloody tough. Uh, mentally and physically, literally, he's on you the whole time. Even when you're not in camp, um, you know, you uh, see his, his name flash up on your phone at all times of the day. Um, you see it after games for your club, uh, his name flashing up and you look at when he's messaged you and it's during the game, things like that. And you just dread it when, when, he, when he rings or, or he texts because um, you worry about what he's going to say. And then when you're in camp, it's literally non-stop from when you wake up in the morning um, to when you go to bed at night. Um, he's always testing you, um, especially mentally, little messages here and there, um, little comments um, passing the corridor, things in, in meetings. Um, testing you on knowledge, um, but but you know that's that's why England have got to, to where they've got to because he's, they've got someone like him, um, you know, leading the way and testing players and keeping them on their toes um, so they can perform at the highest level. But yeah, it's tough um, physically as well. Um, training is is, is brutal, um, especially the highest session of the week. I'm sure it's the same for Jamie when he was with Wales you have to train like that. You have to prepare like that if you want to achieve things as a national team at the, at the highest level of the game. Would you get worried or would any of the players get worried if Eddie didn't text them then? Um, do you know what? I don't know. I don't, we never had that conversation. It's more like, has he spoken to you? And you'd be kind of relieved if he, if he hasn't spoken to you, especially when you're in camp. You just, you just want to stay under the radar, keep your head down. Um and I hope he doesn't want to pick on you, not pick on you, but like pick you out for stuff, call you into his office for one-on-ones. You know, whenever we turned up to camp, you'd always have a one-on-one um, with him as soon as you got there. And, and that'd be the most nerve wracking thing. Everyone queuing up outside his office, um, 
See the headmaster. Get your timings. Yeah, get your timings, and that's the one you don't want to be late for. Um, the one you dread the most. Um, so yeah, it, it's um, mentally tough. Definitely. Yeah, it's fascinating coaching style. I remember Sean Edwards telling me, uh, certainly telling the group when he coached in Wales that uh, if they were speaking to you and if they were regularly speaking to you and critiquing you, it showed that they cared and they saw growth in you. Be worried if we don't speak to you was their message to us, and certainly with Sean Edwards, uh, he was like, if we're not speaking to you, be worried. Um, and so it was It was always that approach. It was kind of like, right, they've got something to say to me, but, you know, I respect the fact because they see development and see growth in my game. I mean, then the lads, they said nothing too. They got really sketchy because they were like, right, they don't care. Yeah, I don't think it's like that with Eddie. I mean, I feel, I feel like with Eddie, he leaves the guys he know he can leave alone, the guys that are sort of at the top of the tree. Like, you don't hear him say much to Owen during sessions or in... in um, public situations I'm sure he speaks to him a lot um, behind closed doors same with Fordy same with Mauro but he really goes for other guys he, he wants to test um, he used to go for players like Marlon Yard all the time with little nicknames just on him the whole time in training just little comments try and wind him up things like that um, and I guess it's him just testing those guys out seeing if they're ready for the step up um, see how they react under pressure things like that um, sometimes it works. Sometimes guys just just um, just can't handle it at all, um, and you don't see them ever again. <laughs> what about Eddie's mind games? We've heard an awful lot about that. So was was pushing your buttons the most that you've ever encountered with Eddie, or was there anything else like snide comments? You know, as you're walking by him, or um, again, not for me. He he was okay with me. Um, but he would he would just drop little comments into meetings about players um, to them. He'd just be he'd just be doing strange things as well. Like we'd be in a in a team meeting, he'd just be lobbing lobbing a tennis ball around and then just lob it at someone to see if they catch it or see if they were focused on the meeting or stop the meeting and ask them a question to see see how they would react and or just just come out with just some random comment with Steve Borfix stood at the front and everyone would just be like, what <laughs> what does he mean? What's going on? Just just random things like that. that that you just don't usually expect from someone. Um, so yeah, yeah, he's just on it. He's just on it the whole time, and he's always thinking about those sort of things. I think he gets off on it. I think he enjoys it. I think he, you can see how the, the way he is with the media as well. He just enjoys that sort of thing, aspiring with the media, the mind games. He's the same with the players, I think. But you've yeah. also had some pretty memorable encounters against the Welsh during your international career. So the two that I would reckon stand out the most are the games at Twickenham during the 2015 World Cup and again in 2018. So we're going to go there. Um, and I want you to talk us yeah. through your recollection of what unfolded with those events. So firstly, I want the one with Sam Warburton and then secondly, with Scott Williams. Um, Sam Warburton. Um, do you know what? I think that was more... So in the week leading up to that game, obviously... You pick out guys um, who are talisman, um, really important to, to Wales or, or the team you're playing against. Um, guys you kind of want to focus on um, in terms of your game plan and, and things like that, especially in your, your defence. Um, guys you want to give time and space to. Guys you want to send a message to the rest of their teammates you know, by hitting them hard and giving them no time and space. And he was one of those guys, obviously being the captain, we'd... we'd um, uh, targeted as a, as a talisman, um, so he wanted to get in his face. Um, there was question marks about his um, maybe his toughness, if, if uh, that's the right thing to say. Not from me, more. Uh, I can say it now, uh, Mike. Five, we're six years down the line now, so it's all right. Bro. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think he's a tough player. So um, there was question marks of, of whether he would he would um, fold on under a bit of pressure, a bit of. Um, Physical uh, intimidation, nothing, nothing um, above the line and, and illegal. And the player, be, be the, the way I am as a player and things like that, obviously that sticks in your mind. And a little, uh, a little, um, not really a scrap. It was a bit of a push and shove, kicked yeah. up. I think I had you by the scruff of the neck, Brown, and pulling him off him. Yeah, but yeah, well, but it didn't start with me. This is the thing. I think someone else. I don't know who who started the little um, pushing and shoving. But then I, obviously I saw him. Sort of on the peripheral of, of the uh, of the scuffle, and I thought, well, I'm going to grab hold of him and, and 
and if they see the the fullback grabbing your captain, your your back row, you know it might ha- you know might have a little impact on them and um, and see that we're up for the game because I I for one was massively up for the game. I always am against Wales. You know it's a massive rivalry. Um, they are for us and, and vice versa for me. So you know I got a hold of him and um, yeah, again it's just silly little pushing and shoving and you know then Doc comes in um, throwing his weight around and making it worse. So. Um, yeah, it's just part of the game, and uh, you can laugh about it afterwards. And they had the, they had the last laugh at the end, of the day, didn't they? So, so they went on and, and won the game, and made us look silly. So sometimes that's just the way it goes. And then um, yeah, I guess the Scott Williams one. Um, I'm guessing you're talking about when he nearly scored in the corner. That was Underhill's cover, you know, unbelievable cover tackle, wasn't it? I took a bit of heat after the game because obviously when he didn't score, I was pretty pleased, um, as you would be. And if it was vice versa, and there has been times against Wales and other other teams as well, when you do something wrong, you give away a penalty, you knock on, you make a mistake, you know, the, the other team let you know about it and and happy you've done that or, you know, getting your face about it. And I think it's just one of them for me, you know, Scott, uh, Jamie knows him better than I do, but when I played against him, he's a kind of like me where, you know, he doesn't take a backward step. He, he gives a bit of chat, um, gets in your face. Um, all things are all part of the game for me and and um, you know I enjoy I, lo- I enjoy that physical confrontation I, I enjoy that challenge from the opposition and he's that sort of player as well and he's done it to me in, in the past nothing nothing major um, so obviously I, I was happy with it, that he didn't score and um, made sure he could see that I was Well Mike speaking about the World Cup if you had to pick England's biggest disappointment during your career would the home World Cup be up there? Or what about the Sam Burgess selection? Apparently it's still one of rugby's greatest mysteries. Um, I know he came out a couple of years ago and blamed egos and selfish players as his reason for England's failure. You know, what are your thoughts on his comments? And I suppose on his selection in general? Surely that's not the best way to handle it. So like, what were you annoyed when you, when you heard what Sam had come out and said? Um, no, not annoyed at all. Because that's his, that's his opinion. He might have been talking about me. I, I don't know. Um, I've never asked him, but um, he, he clearly has that opinion. And, and who am I to say where the guys weren't acting like that? Or he, you know, who am I to say how he should be feeling about it? Um, I can say that sometimes with, with an England team, you do have that problem of um, maybe egos or cliques or groups or um, people put on pedestals. I think that comes with that comes with maybe not being centrally contracted and, and the, the the match fees and things like that because when you're all trying to um, not just play for England because it's England and that's what, what yeah, everything you dreamed of, there's obviously a match fee involved as well and it's it's very very um, it's very lu- lucrative and you obviously all want that so then you can end up with backstabbing and, and egos and things like that and and that that can have a de- detrimental um, impact on, on the team morale. Um, that's some things I have experienced at win and witnessed at times, um, which is is not a great thing. Obviously, I think under Andy, Eddie, it was slightly better um, in terms of cliques and things like that. So maybe that's what um, um, Berger is talking about. Um, again, I've not spoken to him one on one about it. I, I I remember messaging him after he had quit rugby and went back, and just saying to him. Look, I'm disappointed that that you've um that you've quit and 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 you're leaving rugby and going back to rugby league because for me, um I feel like we've all got a responsibility to try and change this and um you know turn a corner with England and, and put things right. Um, but you know I respect your decision and, and I've really enjoyed uh, working alongside you. That was the message I sent to him um, because I still I still feel that he could have been a, um, a quality rugby union player if he, if he just stuck at it. And, but again, you can, who am I to say he should have done that and what he was going through and, and what, he, what he was having to, to deal with? Well, I'll leave you there with that um, and I'll give you a bit of a break. So, Jamie, you're 34, you're 34 years young um, and arguably in the form of your life with Dragons. And there's been a lot of media and fans calling for your place in the Wales squad. So tell us, have you been speaking to Wayne Pivak lately? No, look, I, uh, I think... You, you, you come to. You've been calling him every day, haven't you? you come You've been to calling appreciate him every day. <laughs> Text yeah. him every day. You've been calling him every day. Yeah. You come to appreciate pretty quickly that you 
sometimes you're you're in favour and sometimes you're not. Look, I was I was in I was in favour um, a plenty when I was playing earlier in my career. Um, you know, for near ten years straight under Warren Gatland in my position, and I I got the rub of the green when it came to selection. I was I was picked for the majority of time under him, um, and then for the last. Last three years, uh, I've just been out of the picture. I've still been playing as well. Um, I still feel I've been playing as well and playing, uh, you know, a, a standard required of to be able to step up to Test rugby. But I've just not been selected. Um, and there's different reasons for that: the style of play, the way they want to play the game. Um, we have a big obsession with World Cup cycles now, isn't there? And uh, you know, they fast forward three years and look at it and go, right, is he going to be there during the World Cup? Well then, let's disregard him. And it's just, it's just up to if whether the head coach of a country sees you as part of the plans and sees you as part of a, a team he thinks that can go and win. So I haven't been a part of that the last three years. Obviously, there's a bit of speculation out there, but like I'm, not, I'm not expecting anything. Um, I'm not expecting, you know, selection for the Six Nations. Uh, I'd like to think I'm I'm playing well. Uh, my form is good. I'm enjoying my rugby first and foremost. Um, whether that gets me international recognition is completely out my hands. Um, but you know, I've 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 been very very fortunate to do it the amount of times I have in my career. Um, and you know, I'd 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 love the opportunity to do it again. But as I said, it's 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 not my decision to make. We'll move on to the Lions tour. So I suppose it looks like there is a growing possibility that the tour will be played in Ireland and the UK due to what's happening with COVID in South Africa. I know Jamie's pulling a face here. So I'll ask you first, Jamie, do you think that the tour will take place in some shape or form this summer? It won't take place in South Africa um, with, well, with supporters. I just can't see... Can't see how it'll ever take place in South Africa in this summer. And then the original window... Um, you know, I've, I've I've been asked this question quite a bit. I really, really hope that they exhaust every avenue possible to hold it in South Africa with with fans being able to travel. Realistically, that's not going to happen this calendar year. Um, you know, if we get the vaccine program more or less done in the UK and in South Africa, it's not going to happen. Uh, they won't start vaccinating people in South Africa till the summer, by all accounts. And so. Well, then the only realistic option uh, is, is putting it back till next year. The home nations already have tools in place, so you just can't see how they, they work around that. And so we come to the last option of, of hosting it in the UK, and it's just very different, isn't it? You know, the Lions are traditionally a touring team. It's all about touring. It's about playing, um, you know, those warm-up games against the club size and the lead up to the test match is about a massive group of Lions fans coming over, coming together as one, you know, traveling and supporting the side. Um, and it's such a unique experience. Uh, obviously if they play the spring box in the UK, it's going to be three test matches and that's it. Um, there'll, there'll be provincial games uh, and it'll be a very, very different experience. And I'm just, you know, as much as it'll be about broadcasting revenue and, you know, revenue for both, you know, the Lions and for, for more importantly for South African Rugby Union. Um, it's just going to be such a such a strange um, occasion if it's held in the UK um, and a very different experience for the players, which is, which is a huge shame. Um, yes, there'll still be the, the huge honour of, of putting that jersey on. Um, and many players have, have come out publicly um, and spoken about, you know, wherever it gets played, it's a, it's a huge honour and, and rightly so. But... You know, for me, the Lions, it's all about touring. It's all about being out of your comfort zone, travelling around hotels in a foreign country um, and a foreign country which have huge pride in their rugby and have a massive love for the game as we do here in the UK um, and, you know, New Zealand, Australia, South Africa. So, yeah, it's such a shame, but we'll see. We'll see. I don't know uh, your opinion, Mike, on it, uh, whether you'd want to see it happen in the UK. Would you... Would you be a big fan of it happening in the UK or would you rather them try and push it back so it can happen in South Africa? Yeah, look, I think I, I, I 100% agree with you with, with exhausting all possible ways of having it in South Africa. And then if they can't, and, and I've never played on a Lions tour, and I've never been lucky enough to do that. But for me, the whole thing about the Lions is the tour inside and, and what that brings, you know, all those guys that, um, don't play for the same teams, don't play for the same countries, all touring together, having that sort of old school factor of it as well. 
that's a big part of it for me. Um, and then also, even if they do have it in the UK, are we going to have fans in? Are we going to have supporters in? Because if we don't, again, like Jenny said, that that isn't the other big factor for me is is what the lines bring. Um, all those supporters that would usually travel, but you know, traveling around the UK to 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 see those games, if that's taken away, that that's that's that just loses all all the the thing that's special to about the lines for me. Um, you know, all those all those supporters that are supporting guys from England that are from Wales and and all those other countries. Um, that's that that's what makes it so special for me. So if, if that's not going to be there, I just don't see how they can have it um because it just takes it away from me and jamie i suppose blowing off steam is a big thing on tour especially you know you're bringing four different nations together um so i want to know i suppose who was the best guy that you roomed with for the night's out those are glorified snag the lines as well uh let's not forget that you know I think one of the great things is that you get the <laughs> tap on the shoulder on a after a game where they'd you know, you say you play on it. There's Wednesday game, Friday game, Wednesday, Friday, Wednesday, Friday. You get the tap on the shoulder on the Wednesday straight after a match. And they'd either tell you, look, we need you to back up Saturday. Um, or look, we don't need you for Saturday. Go and have a go and have a few beers with the lads. And the lads who weren't needed for the following game would all go out on the town, have a good time. As long as you fronted up the next day, they wouldn't, you know, wouldn't really care. You, you know, you hydrate, you crack on. And you go again, and, and the same happens on the Saturday. You know, if you played and you were needed for the following Wednesday, they'd tap you on the shoulder in the change room and be like, look, don't go out tonight. We need you for, for in four days' time. Um, and going out, enjoying it with fans, meeting people, having a few drinks, that's what touring is all about. Um, again, in the UK now, is <laughs> are, they, are the lads going to have the ability to do that? In the UK, probably not. It looks like beers in the team room. Uh, for the Lions lads this summer, if it if it goes ahead in the UK, so uh, best players for an Powell, he was brilliant in '09. Andy Powell, like uh, he was just that guy who who had the ability to just connect people um, on a night out, or you know when it came to social stuff, uh, he was he was kind of this this magnet that just attracted uh, entertainment to him, and he was you know he was brilliant, and people like that. Are, are, uh, you know, crucial when you tour and crucial when, you, when you're when you away from home for a while and keep keep the lads entertained. Okay, well, do you have any other infamous stories about Andy Powell from a night out on the Lions tour that maybe that we haven't already heard or hasn't been out in the media? Um, I don't have one for the Lions. I, I played with him for the Barbarians in 09. So after that tour, a few of us, myself, uh, Andy and Lee, were invited down to London. We played the All Blacks for the Bar Bars. Beat the All Blacks at Twickenham, sold out Twickenham, which was just an amazing experience. One of the best rugby weeks of my life. And Pauli, I think on Tuesday night or Wednesday night, he, he messages me at like one in the morning. He's like, Jamie, come to my room. I, I, I've got problems with my heart. And he's obviously he's obviously had quite a few to drink and he's got real bad acid reflux. But he's convinced it's his heart and he's convinced he's halfway towards dying. Like I think he's wrestling Victor Matfield in the bedroom. I, I turn up, he's got his top off, he's wrestling Victor Matfield and he's convinced he's going to die. So that was quite entertaining, especially when you're, when you're pretty pissed at three in the morning. Um, yeah, he was that sort of bloke. He was always up to always up to something, but brilliant, brilliant guy and, and you know, perfect in a, in, on those sorts of trips. Right, well, you two played together at Harlequins for three years. So I want to know, what was it like sharing a field with one another? Oh, it was good. I look. I I think. Um, be honest, Jamie. Be honest. Yeah, I'll be honest. I don't I, want to, I don't want you to sit on the fence. No media answers no, here. No, I think I got a very different impression of Mike when I joined the club than what I thought of him before I joined. And in my impression before, he was, you know, this angry guy. Who just who was just proper wound up. You know, every game was about being kind of feisty, seemed frustrated and stuff. And, um, you know, I got a very different impression of Mike than when I joined the club, got to know him much better and understood that that tied in with his, with his determination, right, to win. Like the guy, <laughs> the guy played a lot of times for England. He's been, you know, he's played professional rugby at the highest level for a long time. Um, and his desire, desire to succeed um, manifests itself as, as an angry bloke on the pitch. And I came to respect that. Um and he just wants to win. 
just wants to win. And, you know, different people elicit that in different ways. And Mike was one who, who displayed quite a bit of emotion, uh, certainly in, in training and uh, and in the game as well. So, you know, to play 17 years for, for a club and to do it at the highest level in the, in the Premiership is is mightily impressive, um, especially considering how attritional the Premiership is. Um, yeah, and definitely one of the most talented fullbacks I've played with. Well, that's a lovely answer. Thanks, Thanks. It's really nice. I've changed my answer now. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm um, to be honest, when, when Jamie came, he, he was exactly as I'd, I'd been described and I thought he'd be, you know, with his flashy watches and um, his nice clothes and a man about the town, like you said, that Ugo and that were. You, you were one of them as well. Um, but no, you, you, you'd always turn up for training sometimes. Um, weren't too keen on the on the physical side of training, but you looked after your body well, didn't you? Um, but you'd always put it in on the weekend and you were a good leader for us because you had you had uh, Marcus one side um, who was then you know straight out of school. You had to basically babysit. Um, and then you had he Mark was young. Do you know what Marcus, mate? Can you remember when he first came into the squad? I mean, this lad, he, he, was he must have been like 17. And I, he first yeah, came into training with the squad yeah. when I was in my first year there. And he absolutely carved us up. And everyone was like, who is this bloke? <laughs> yeah, so that was that was the year before he turned up. So he would have been 16 then, I think. And he came to training. Um, they got him in from school on, on one of his days off and he came in and trained and he absolutely carved us up, didn't he? Making line breaks, throwing missed passes, cutting out all our defence, little chip and chases. Basically what he's doing now in the Premiership, but he was doing this to us and everyone was just stood there like, this school kid is literally taking the piss out of us here. Um, but you can see that now with his talent. But yeah, you were babysitting him one side and had Joe March on the other side. Um, again, babysitting him because he is the biggest space kid at I've probably ever played with. I mean, I've been in one game with him. Been in one game with him where he's looking up to the sky and he, and he's and, and someone would call a move and and, and then another person would say, well, "What was the move, Joe?" And he'd be going, "Aeroplane." And you're like, "What do you mean aeroplane?" He'd be like, "Yeah, there's an aeroplane." And this is the middle of a game at the stoop. I don't know if you're playing then, Jamie, but and everyone would be looking like, "Are you serious?" <laughs> like he's the biggest space kid that I've ever played with, but and you had to deal with both of them either side of you. So no, all credit to you. Well, now, Mike, don't shoot the messenger, but I do have to ask this question. So there was somewhat of a misunderstanding during a team social in the build up to the World Cup in 2019 between yourself and Ben Teo. So I think he spoke about it over the summer and said that he regrets his actions. You know, have you guys made up since then? No, look, um, to be fair to him, he reached out to a message with a message to me quite soon afterwards. And I wasn't really in a place to, to respond to that message you know, I've just been dumped out of the World Cup squad. Um, and then that, obviously that happened as well, pretty much exactly the same time. It felt like to me that, that what happened to me was using it as an excuse not to select me, which wasn't wasn't the case, I don't think. So, you know, back then I wasn't in a, in a place to, to reply to him. Maybe if he did now, I'm not sure. Um, I probably would respond. Um but look, yeah, it was it's just um, a situation you don't want to find yourself in. A situation I was trying to avoid uh, the best way I could at the time. Um, and then to then lead on to not making the World Cup squad, all that put together, it just it, it just created an incredibly tough time for me. And then it obviously came out and um, no one knew what happened. And I, you know, I was just keeping my head down and it's not my place to, to say these sort of things and what, what happened and stuff like that um so yeah it was tough but mainly because I didn't go to the World Cup and I still a bit like what Jamie was saying I was still playing some of my best rugby um I was told I was I was just a defensive fullback um whereas Elliot Daly was the attacking fullback but um with my performances and my stats for Quinns which was the only place at the time that I could um show what I was about were, were great like my, my tax stats were the best that were that they had ever been since I started playing rugby so I wasn't really sure um what else I could do so all that added together with the Bentio situation um that made it for a tough time look things happen on us on the social um Mike what was like what was that trigger point behind that. the disagreement or you know how like how did that unfold 
They both just had a few to drink, Christina. As things happen in rugby. Yeah, so... Jamie, that, that, was, that was kind of the thing for me. You know I'm not a big drinker, Jamie. And it was the same case um, for that social. I had a few at the end of an incredibly tough block of, of training. And Eddie and, and the senior players had really emphasised the fact that we want, needed to socialise and enjoy these, these times together. So I bought into that by having a few probably two or three was was in the in the group of guys that were more um, sat having a social beer and just having a chat and then enjoying each other's company. And I think Tio was probably, and I'm sure he admit to himself and, and others, he was more in the group that uh, wanted to get a bit loose and uh, really enjoying the uh, social um, and each to their own. But then when you try and mix those two groups and, and, things starting to happen and the way T.O. is he's a bit of a wind up merchant, merchant, merchant and he likes to try and wind people up and obviously he'd had a few too many as well um, things things had escalated all I can say for myself is I tried the best best way I could to avoid the situation it would have been nice probably to have others um, staff and players trying to help me in that situation the only guys funny enough that did try and help me in this situation were the young guys from Quinn's actually, uh, Don Brandt and March, who really stepped up to try and, um, yeah, just just quash the situation before it escalated, which was which was nice actually to see that from them. Um, but then it did escalate, and yeah, things things happen, um, and then it is what it is, I guess. That's the thing. I mean, these sorts of things happen in rugby clubs across the country every weekend. Uh, especially when we're not in a pandemic. But uh, look, it goes to show it happens at the top level of the game as well. Um, you know, with players the way they are, you know, certainly when we've had a few beers, like, there's been loads of occasions in my career where I've been lap around lads and they get a bit feisty, you know, things are said. And, you, you know, you, you go in the following week and it's all a bit awkward, everyone shakes hands and you get on with it. So I guess, you know, yours happened around a time when you, you weren't picked for that World Cup. So it was probably a very tough time for you. Um, you know, personally around that and, you know, fair play for you to, to share in that. Yeah, like, we really appreciate your honesty. Yeah, and a, and a fat, fat black eye to go, fat black eye to go with the non-selection as well. Um, Tio's a, a handy one with his, with his fists, you know. He doesn't like to do a lot of rugby training, but he does a lot of boxing on the side of the pitch and he, <laughs> he definitely showed that in, in what he gave me that, that day. Um, but yeah, like James said, things happen on a social, you know, like I said, I tried the best way I could to, to stop it before it started escalating because I didn't want to be in that situation. Um, Jamie knows what I'm like. I'm not a big drinker. I'm not one for, um, and I get a bit stick at Quinn's for not being the most sociable guy and not one for massive socials, but, you know, I was trying to buy into what the team wanted, what they're about. And, and I was actually having a really good time just conversing with guys that didn't usually um, get to speak to and, um, on a good level and uh, at the end of a tough uh, training block, like I said. So it was just a shame it ended the way it did. And then that that was my last sort of moment um, being involved with England, which is a shame. Well, that is a shame. Well, look, I won't ask you anymore. I won't prod you anymore about it. I really appreciate how honest you've been so far. But I'm actually going to get really deep here and I'm going to ask you guys, what's the most frustrated you've ever been with your teammates, you know, when you felt like nobody was on your A game? Probably when Mike Brown dropped that high ball against Northampton in 2017. No, I, I, uh, I get quite frustrated at times and I show my frustration. Lads giving away dumb penalties around halfway kills me. Absolutely kills me. Like lying on the wrong side of the ball in a ruck and just giving teams easy entry into your 22. And I sometimes lose my head. Um, it's my biggest gripe. My other privately biggest gripe is kickers missing touch off penalties, but... I rarely make my frustration known. Well, they know now because you've said it. I keep it to myself. Those are my biggest I'm two. Gonna, I'm going to add to that, Jamie. Um, my my biggest gripe is wingers that get uh, tackled into touch. That absolutely kills me, and it kills the team. It, like the energy, <laughs> just, when they, there's nowhere to go, and they still try and go on the outside, and they just get tackled into touch, and then you just turn the ball over. But yeah, I think. For me, last week, frustration was massive because we played London Irish and 
we we bombed a, a two try lead, I think it was, and ended up drawing. Um, down to our ill discipline, turning the ball over, and, and like Jamie says, when you're giving away stupid penalties like we were doing, when actually we were defending well, and then they just kick three points or kick to the corner, um, and then we could see them all try. It just absolutely kills you, and then the frustration just builds from there, and then you, then you just end up, you know, running around like a headless chicken, frustrated with each other, frustrated with the ref, everything, and, and it, it just kills you, doesn't it, Jamie? Oh God. Well, I'll move on to our tourist 15 section. So we've been putting together our best tourist 15 over the last couple of episodes, made up of those who are always looking to have a good time and let their hair down when they're off the field. So this week, we're ideally looking for a second row or a full back to gain selection into the team. So Mike, throughout the 15 years that you've played the game professionally, who was the best value socially in one of those positions apart from yourself? Well, it definitely wouldn't be me. So that's... <laughs> That's an easy start. I think I was struggling with second row, to be honest, trying to think of someone. So I, I kind of thought outside the box and I'm thinking Nick Easter, who played second row for Quinns a few times. He, for me, like epitomises a social player. Like he was always leading the charge when we had away games on the social. He'd be the one um, organising socials, always the one um, leading the court session before we went out for the socials. Um, and he, you know, he'd get loose and he'd, he'd absolutely love it. And he was, he was very old school in that sense. And um, he was a big part of what we were about in 2012 in terms of enjoying each other's company on, on and off the field. So if I could slip him in somewhere, at least he can go in the second row because I see number eight's taken already. But um, apart from him as the second row, I can't think of anyone else. I think he was, so we, we had a, um, uh, a European trip away I think it was in France and, and our head coach John Kingston at the time um, ended up getting his room um, broken into but it was with a with a hotel key that they'd taken from from the hotel lobby they went in and, and flipped his bed it ended up getting blamed on George Robson who wasn't there but I think Minty was the one leading the charge so they'd come in off, off a night out and just thought they'd, they'd give it a go by trying to get someone's someone's key they picked John Kingston being the head coach and um, asked for, it, for for the room key of John Kingston. They gave it to, to these players, and I think it was it was Minty leading the charge with that. They went in his room. Apparently, he was he was on his bed, stark bollock naked. They ran in, flipped his bed. I think it was like, I think Danny Kerr was one of them. Um, Nick Evans, Ugo. They ran in, flipped his bed, and then, and then um, turned his room over and then just legged it. Um, and for some reason he thought it was George Robson, who was actually his, his, his sort of favourite player and um, absolutely loved George Robson. So, so the next morning at 6am, at, at, uh, they had um, a coaches meeting to, to review the game, look over it, uh, watch the game together. So they called up George Robson thinking it was him and made him come down for, I think it was two hours, something like that, sit and watch the game with, with him, just sat in the corner, no one spoke to him and then just said, leave. And he, he had no idea. George had no idea why, but it was because of that. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's that's. Uh, Mint, I think Minty was leading the charge on that. Jeez, that I gotta tough. say, I would not have the plums to nick my coach's room key and go and flip him over whilst he's asleep, bollock naked in bed. Jesus, especially J.K. as well. Oh, that's, pretty, that's, pretty, yeah, that's pretty impressive going. Like I, I would not have the plums to do that. <laughs> Mike, I have another social question, but I know I know you're not the biggest drinker, but I suppose, you know, can you tell me, you know, what was maybe the best night out that you've ever experienced of your career? It, just, it kind of doesn't really have to be about drink. Yeah, best night out. Um, I did have a fair few that, few that, that night. It was um, 2011 or 10, one of those years. It was an away trip to Munster, and it's when we beat Munster in the, in the quarterfinal. Hands down, the best night out we, we've had court session led by Minty um, to start with um, then, then into, into Limerick um, and it was just a sea of red jerseys from the game, all their supporters and, and, and we thought we might be in a bit of bother um, the amount of supporters but they absolutely were brilliant like they, they, they had massive respect for us that we, we'd won the game they were brilliant, they were really welcoming um, we, had, we had a class night which went on to 
the very early hours of the morning and we just had great fun and, and uh, yeah that, that for me is hands down the best um, social we've ever had and I think a lot of the other lads would agree as well. Jamie what would you say has been the best night out that you've experienced so far? Well there's a few um, the best ones I can't remember much obviously a first cap is a big one I can't remember my night out after my first cap for Wales uh, in Cardiff um, got carried home by my mates Oh, there's a few, like Wales-England 2013 was big, um, big, big, big night. I was actually planning that night out with Alex Cuthbert with 10 minutes left of the game. Oh, Alex. Yeah, that was awesome. Uh, so we were having a chat about where we were going to go as England were kicking off after he scored the second try, which was quite good fun. Uh, and that night was just immense. Like the whole of Cardiff was open to the lads. Um, I think I ended up on the DJ decks in Revolution playing some songs as one of VTubers was big and all his music was uh, every other song. So that was good. And then, yeah, Sydney was pretty cool. Uh, end of that Lions tour, we ended up a rooftop kind of, um, you know, pool bar in, in, I think it's called the Ivy in Sydney, I think. Uh, it's a rooftop, rooftop kind of pool bar. And we had that whole area to ourselves, a few of the lads jumping in the pool in their suits and stuff, um, which was pretty good fun. But yeah, there's some so so many good memories from from you know away games are brilliant. You know, you play European away games. Um, they're some of the best weekends. You know, when you go out to France or you go out to Dublin, but you fly back. Sorry, you go to France, go to Ireland, but you fly back the day day after the game. But you know, as soon as the European schedule comes out, you always look for which ones are potential to have a good uh, good trip away and capitalize on on being in in France or Ireland or where, wherever you're going to be in the world. Oh, I really do hope that, that it just goes back to that soon enough. I'm hopeful. I am ever, yes. I'm forever going to stay the optimistic person. So exactly. hopefully we yeah, can support as and players. That. No yeah. doubt. Absolutely. Well, that's it from us. Thanks to Jamie Roberts and Mike Brown. And thanks to you for listening. More offloading next week. Make sure to subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts so you get them as soon as it's released. Leave us a rating and review if you can. And don't forget to check us out on YouTube as well. Thanks, guys.